Um, so thanks everyone um, for joining today's Short Circuit webinar. Um, in case you don't know me, I'm Alice. I'm one of the talent executives for Short Circuit, um, which in case you don't know, is a programme for new and emerging filmmaking talent in Scotland. Um, so before I introduce our guests uh, here with us today, I just want to plug some of the opportunities we have open at the moment. Um, one is Convergence, which is an intensive screenwriting course for writers and artists coming from other mediums looking to transition to film. Deadline for that is the 5th of January. Um, you can find more information about that on our website um, and get your applications in over Christmas. Um, and we also have script development funding for first features available. Um, also check that out on our website. That's a rolling, so there's no deadline. Um, also just want to uh, encourage you to keep an eye on the upcoming events we have with Glasgow Film, um, such as this one. Um, so on the 21st of December next week, we have the next Short Circuit Film Club. Um, where we're discussing shorts from New Zealand. Um, so we've really set that film club up as an opportunity to network. Uh, so you can watch the films, you don't have to watch the films, um, but it's a great way to just like meet people in this awkward um, sort of digital space we now live in. Um, so today's discussion um, is on the topic of concept to script. So we're really grateful to be joined by Glasgow-based writer-director Adura Onashile and producer Rosie Crerard to chat about the process of getting their short film Expensive Shit Made. Um, hopefully you've all had a chance to watch it because the link, link was out this morning. Um, we're very grateful to Rosie and Adura for sharing that with us. Um, so I've got some questions to ask them both initially, um, but would encourage everyone to put questions that you might have for them both in the Q&A box. Um, I'll keep about 20 minutes at the end um, to make sure we can get through as many as possible. Um, we also have live captioning available, so please click the clo uh, closed caption button. Yep, it's there um, at the bottom of the screen if you want to enable those. Um, so, hi, Rosie and Adora. Thank you for joining us. Hi, hi, everyone. Thank you for having us. Can I, um, I'll get you both first to introduce yourselves and sort of maybe give a brief bit of background. Uh, okay, uh, my name is Adura and uh, I come from a theatre background and I trained as a dancer and an actor and uh, I started writing for theatre around seven years ago I think it was, I did a solo show and um, I started writing for film about four years ago. Um, yeah, I still work in theatre. Um, I guess I'm not acting as much anymore, so my focus is mostly on writing and directing. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. I'm a mother <laughs> of a two-year-old, which is which is important. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what I do. Thanks. Uh, me too. I'm a mother of a two-year-old um, and a producer. I set up. Barry Creer with my business partner and pal Kira Barry uh, back in 2016 with the support of a BFI Vision Award. We had worked together maybe 10 years before that um, for like on a kind of previous incarnation of Short Circuit which was um, digital with the um, UK Film Council back then. So we were developing shorts um, as development and production execs within that initiative. We also, I was producing shorts alongside that and um, had worked for film festivals. I kind of straddled, as a lot of producers do, many different um, things. Uh, so it's been a long and windy road, I think, to get here. But yeah, film festivals, I founded the Glasgow Short Film Festival. Um, I then went to Australia and worked for Flickerfest and Sydney Film Festival. I also worked in talent de um, script development for Screen Australia. I then came back to the UK and worked um, with the BFI London Film Festival, which was my last film festival after that. I decided to focus entirely on um, filmmaking and returned to Scotland. Uh, and then I worked for a while with Creative Scotland as um, a development and production exec maternity cover and I stayed on for a little bit after. And then, yeah, 2016, set up the company. And since then, we've been developing a slate of our own projects with Adura and um, writer-director Ruth Paxton and Paul Wright, among others. And we've co-produced three films, um, Irene's Ghost, a documentary run with Scott Graham um, and producer Margaret Matheson and uh, 
uh, last year we're still in post-production on Nobody um, Has to Know, which is our first international co-production. Um, and we hope to go into production with Adura's feature debut, Get Girl, in the spring, which would be our first out year production. Great, thank you both. Um, so I think we'll start, I really want to sort of track the development process and going in depth quite a bit on um, expensive shit and how you made that. Um, but maybe first we'll go a little bit further back. Um, and Adura, just can you tell us a bit about your, your background in theatre and, and how you got to that point as a, as a writer? Yeah, um, I, I think I, uh, e even when I was studying, my, my degree was all about making, but when I came out of um, uni, it didn't feel like I was getting many opportunities to make. So then I became a performer more, much more, but I always knew that I wanted to develop my own work. And I thought that would be more devising because that was my background. Um, and it got to the point where I just wasn't getting the sort of roles I wanted to get. So I decided to just try and write for myself and um, write a, a part for myself, so a solo show, which was quite a big leap to make at the time for me. And I found a great producer, who um, Chloe Deer, who was um, really supportive in that journey because I'd never written before. And I had this story and I didn't quite know how to put it together. And we went through a very a process not dissimilar to, to kind of script writing and, and development in film where we kind of wrote and then tried things out on, on, on their feet and then wrote again. And each time we asked for a little bit more money. So it took about a year and a half. And then I had a solo show and the show did well. I really loved the process of writing for performance. Um, but I wasn't really sure that I would still call myself a writer. And so the next thing I did was expensive shit because I really wanted to challenge myself to be outside of the performance space and just write and direct, well, initially just write and, and see if I could actually construct a play. Um, so that was the process of writing expensive shit. And uh, about halfway through writing it, I think uh, between the second and third draft, I was like, oh, maybe I should just try and direct it. Um, and, uh, and I decided to do that. Both big risks, um, but it got to the point where I'd taken a risk in writing a solo anyway, that it made sense to take a risk to write a full play and then to take a risk to direct, you know? So, yeah, but I, would, I, would, I think that transition from performing to writing has always been sort of propelled by a desire to have more autonomy and to, and to kind of write the sort of parts I'm interested and sort of stories I'm interested in. Yeah. Um, do you want me to talk about the, the transition to film or is that? Yeah, maybe you could talk about it in the, maybe start with it because the short film is based on your stage play of expensive yeah. shit. So how did that initial idea for the play come about? Um, and then maybe we can talk about how it then became a film idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I always, um, I'm always interested in writing about things that sort of confuse me or that I have you know, that I have a slightly uncomfortable relationship with. So um, so in the solo show, it was about women whose cells, a black woman in America whose cells were, were the first cells to be kept alive outside the human body, but, but she wasn't told about it and didn't find, about, find out about it till much later. So in that, I was looking at scientific progress versus, you know, kind of um, personal agency. And then in the play, I had always wanted to look at I was always been fascinated by toilet attendants um, in not the best way, because often toilet attendants were of Nigerian heritage and so am I. And I always really felt uncomfortable. Like I'd be out clubbing and then I'd go to the toilets and then I'd have to like get all like um, respectful to my auntie because they were always older and I'd find myself going, yes, ma, no, ma, when actually I was off my head or I was drunk. You know, it was just like a really, it, it was just a really, odd situation to find myself in and, and the dynamics of it were really interesting to me. So I knew I wanted to write about that. I knew I wanted to write about these women who were alienated, but actually saw things that we'd rather hide. And then um, in order, because I knew that was quite negative or not negative, I, I knew that was quite problematic because there's, an, there's exploitation involved in that. In, in, in that role. I wanted to lift it a little bit. So I, I, I knew 
that I wanted a past for her that was much more full of love and joy and youthfulness. And um, whenever I describe expensive shit, I'm like three completely disparate ideas brought together. So anyway, I wanted to write about um, Fela Kuti and the shrine. And, um, and then I also found out about the two-way mirror in the club in Glasgow. And I'll be totally honest, the reason I put those three things together is because I thought nobody's ever going to let me write a play again. So let me just get everything out <laughs> that I ever <laughs> want to write in one thing. And then, you know, you can just say, yeah, you did it. And that was what expensive shit was. It was, it was, it was started with wanting to write about toilet attendants, then wanting to write about Fela Kuti and the role of women in Afrobeat. Then I found out about the shimmy club in Glasgow and it just seemed like three seemingly really disparate ideas um, came together and I constructed that the play out of it. So the play was set in Glasgow in 2013 and in Lagos in Nigeria in the 1980s and it had the exploitation of women in club culture but also the exploitation of women from the Afrobeat scene in sort of um, Falakuti's rev revolutionary um, politics. So see how hard that is to say? I think that was how hard it was to sell the play. <laughs> there was just so much going on in it. Um, was there any point in the writing of the play that you were like, I don't know how I'm bringing all these elements together? How did you push uh, through that? Right up to opening night. <laughs> right. Because uh, it was just like, yeah, it was it literally, the piecing of the play to, of the story was, how can I make these three ideas of location, character, and history work together? That was, and in a, in a, in a way, that kind of saved me from the, oh, am I a good writer or a bad writer? The, um, the aim was just make this hang as a story together. And once I felt like I, I, I sort of did that, then it felt um, like I'd, I'd achieved something. I, w I was never totally convinced by it, mm -hmm. but at least it didn't, totally feel like three disparate ideas by the time mm. it got to um it got on stage and I suppose your question is what was the writing process like yeah that was it so it's not till afterwards and I still question whether I'm a writer or not because I didn't come at it from three act structure or five act structure I came out I came at it from can I perform this what kind of performer am I to, can I put these three ideas together in a way that makes sense? And it's only now in the transition to writing for film that I've much, I'm much more grounded in structure and acts. Um, and I think sometimes as a writer, you do things um, on instinct because we're all storytellers. And, um, but, but it's really important to, under, to understand the discipline of it as well and the structure and structures that work. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'll bring Rosie in now and because um, Rosie, you, I think you saw um, Expensive Shit, was it Edinburgh Fringe that you saw it? And you, from seeing the play, you, you sort of recognised that um, its potential to be adapted for the screen. Can you talk about maybe what it was in Adora's work that you saw? Um, I mean, it was, I guess, multiple things. We were um, obviously struck by its visual potential. I mean, the staging of the play, so it was, it was set in a toilet, um, a club toilet, uh, which also kind of crossed over into a dance floor in places. But the, um, the audience, you were behind the mirror, so you were looking on to, I mean, there, was, there wasn't a mirror, obviously, but you as the audience were behind this imaginary mirror, this, this fourth wall. And um, so it raised questions thematically around complicity and perspective automatically. And I loved that from, from the get-go, you were kind of forced into, you know, challenge. You, had, you were kind of put into um, a perspective to try to kind of think about how you were perceiving these characters and how they were playing against each other just by your, where you were positioned as an audience member as well, right, physically. Um, and I just thought there was a lot in Adura's writing, especially around her characterizations, as she's mentioned, that was really exciting in terms of the complexity of those characters. Like Adura's always really interested in 
in those uncomfortable truths sit side by side, you know, and, and, and not having kind of stereotypical characters in that way. But it's, so yeah, it was the characterization, it was the, the potential for the visual uh, kind of expansiveness of it and um, how immersive that felt. And the unique perspective that we had, like I feel that we haven't seen in Scottish cinema to date, you know, or on screen to date. Um, and so we approached a door off the back of that and we had, um, I think we had some coffees <laughs> at the CCA in Glasgow. And it was actually kind of more broadly, you know, when we were setting up the company, it was, um, we had a, cause it was in 2016, we had conversations with a few people and it was, you know, we recognized Adura as somebody that we were really interested in working with and then sitting down having a conversation with her about what would that be, how would we work together and what, and it was quite organic in that way. Um, you know, we were interested in expensive shit, but we were also interested in um, talking more broadly about other projects that we could work on together. And um, in the end, we adapted expensive shit. It's obviously a very different um, story to to the theatre production. You know, we, mm. by its nature, the as a short film, we zoned in on one particular element and it became, as I'm sure Dura will talk about, something unto itself. Um, but then we had maybe a, three or four other projects, other ideas that Dura had and shared with us. And then we talked around those and sent it on um, Girl, which is a feature project that we have to Dura as well. Mm. So where you, um, we'll go into the sort of um, script development process in a second, but I'm just curious, because um, it seems to link quite nicely about the strategy of like, as a producer, of, um, how you're going to work together with Adura and develop as a talent. So were you already thinking about the feature at that point um, and talking about Girl as an idea? And then how, sort of, how can we get Adura ready for Girl? What are the steps we need to take to get her there? Yeah, sure. Um... Yeah, we're always thinking about features. That's where we want to be. Mm. Um, and so it was bridging that journey. And I think we recognise that, you know, she was somebody that hadn't written for screen before. And so, uh, you know, we could adapt, we wanted to adapt the feature, but uh, to develop a feature, but also it felt appropriate to, to work. And we loved expensive shit. And we felt that we wanted to see that on screen as well. Um, so yeah, we started, the ambition was we started off with expensive shit and then uh, in kind of in tandem, we were talking about the uh, girl, the feature as well. And so the, sh the ambition was to do the short, if I remember rightly. It, it's kind of, we've had babies in between, it's all become a bit convoluted, but um, that we were gonna develop, yeah, we started to develop the short and meanwhile we were developing the feature and the ambition was that Adura would write and direct the short and that would be a stepping stone to, to the feature as well. Right, so let's let's talk about how easy or difficult or fun, challenging it was taking like a, a play that's presumably like over an hour long to a 15 minute short script um, and then taking it for funding after that. But let's let's focus on the script side of it first. So um, in, I, in hindsight, I can, I think that the way I kind of approached it without realizing is I was creating a kind of short story out of a longer story. So I knew that, for example, we couldn't flip between Lagos and Glasgow in a short. So already one, as one whole narrative thread of the, of the play was gone. Um, and, and then, and that was fine. And then it became what, what was the thing I wanted to achieve that I didn't achieve in the play as, as uh, successfully? And for me, it was the power of that two-way mirror and the sense of absolute jeopardy that the character is in through the night. And I thought, and so, so I knew those two things were something that I needed to get across. So it was relatively straightforward. Um, in terms of choosing which part of the which parts of the play needed to end up in the short film, but then there was a whole process to go through to making it a short film that worked, and we did um, a development process with SFTN that was that was similar. Obviously, 
that you guys do as well, where there's a whole heap of us and then half of us are taken on and we go through the whole process of writing and rewriting and workshops and development. And so we went through that with expensive shit and, um, and it just kept homing in, honing in, sorry, on what, ascent, what are the essential story beats? Because when you're doing a short film, there isn't, you, I mean, you could do a short film however you want, but for us, because it felt very much like it was being propelled by the jeopardy that Tolu was in, then it was how, do we, how are we really succinct with those beats? And it was, a, it was a process of honing in and honing in, getting rid of all the stuff that you presume you need and going straight to it. And what is it people say, get in late and leave early, um, was sort of uh, something that I understood more and more through that process. Um, and it wasn't an easy process. Um, there's some things that are helpful. You know that you have a certain amount of pages that it's got to be in, but then, Within that, you've got to get an arc that feels satisfying. That, and, 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 you know, and it's difficult with a short, especially if there's a thriller-esque element to, to it a bit. It's difficult to know how to, how to let that land in a way that feels satisfying. And so that took a few goes, mm. a, few, a few drafts, I think. And was there anything, I mean, how much do you think the, film resembles the original like um is there anything from the play that you tried to keep in that you you had to lose or I feel like it's it was quite organic yeah sorry I feel like it's a completely different entity and that makes mm. sense to me it's a completely different medium mm. um it makes sense and I never ever thought that I was trying to replicate the play I really leaned into the fact that it was a completely different medium and the story might pan out differently and the character ended up being different to the play so quite a lot for me the, the, the only thing that's really similar people might agree with this is the two-way mirror it's that it's set in a club with a two-way mirror otherwise and there's a drug bottle of water but otherwise everything feels very very different um, and that's exciting. I think if you are going to adapt, then you should lean into the new form instead of thinking, oh, I, this worked in the play, so I really must make sure mm. it works in the film. Just, it's more about embracing this new medium. And it's so exciting to do that because there's a massive difference between film and, and the stage. You know, in the mm. sta on stage, people have to tell you what's going on. Mm. On film, you can be shown what's going on. And I can't tell you, like, it's like chalk, chalk and cheese sometimes um, in terms of the writing process. So was there consciously, I'm sure, or did it, I mean, coming from theatre, did it help to have this go through a development scheme where you had a lot of external feedback, maybe asking you to pair back dialogue? Or again, did you sort of intuitively, it sounds like you sort of knew what you had to do in that sort of adapting something from stage to screen? I mean, it was a process. I mean, Rosie mm -hmm. was will agree it's a, it was a process of learning but it was learning by doing and mm -hmm. I learned best that way anyway so um uh I can't remember what your question was now what was it what did you just ask I'm not, sure. I'm not sure really <laughs> <laughs> was it a question it I think it the schemes that you've been through was it <laughs> I think <laughs> just knowing like maybe what is the big difference I suppose in in formats um um, and I, but I have to be really careful because if I'm making judgments about theatre and film, it's about the kind of writer I was in theatre. And the kind of writer I was in theatre was I felt like everything needed to be spelled out mm. so that you absolutely understood where I was coming from. And in film, I, I just love that I can be a lot more complex because it's about it's about visuals and you're allowing the audience to make up their minds to a certain extent because you're not feeding them what a character is feeling or how the story is developing. So film feels a lot more exciting to me because, because of that complexity. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. And Rosie, could you talk about the producer's role in the development process, like how involved you are, um, maybe the process of getting notes from funders um, and how to either take the, or to know what to take on board and what you need for the story and what to maybe say, actually, that's not what we're doing. I mean, it depends on the producer and it depends on mm. the person that you're working with, the writer as well, um, with Adura, because um, 
it was quite a shift from, as, she, as Dura mentioned, from theatre to, to film. Uh, we felt it was a worthwhile to build um, in some time with uh, SFTN and the so there was an initiative called the Right for Film that Dura was part of, as well as um, which then I think led into being part of the talent pool uh, for the short. And then off the because we through Right for Film there was a short and the feature in tandem that we were developing, and so she um, we went into the, the process with. Um, for the short, but also then we took the feature to eye features and, was, and were developed through that. So the, it was quite scheme heavy, I suppose, and we wouldn't necessarily always work in that way, but it felt useful to have, you know, we, we hadn't worked with theatre writers before either, so it felt useful to work specifically in a, um, in a way with, you know, we had, I think there was a, a number of people in Write for Film who'd come from theatre and it was kind of designed to kind of help bridge that transition in places. Um, I think as a starting point, it was useful. But as we move forward, um, uh, we've kind of ended up just kind of developing ourselves. You know, I think you know through the short, there were quite a lot of people involved. There were quite a lot of voices in terms of the execs who were really, especially Paul Welsh, who was really supportive and um, a real kind of asset to the development process. Um, but as we've moved forward with the feature, we've kind of it's become less and less, and it's. And I think now it's more, it's Dura and myself and, and Kira and it's, and we've got to a point that we're really happy with, with where we're at with it. But um, in terms of what a producer, so yeah, I mean, I guess with Kira and I, you know, we have kind of different functions. Like I lead on development and Kira, um, we both produce everything together, but um, Kira leads on more physical production. Uh, and with, um, in terms of developing projects, we kind of, you know, you have a version of this, of the, we work on a draft or whatever of the treatment and then to the, to the draft quite a lot internally. Um, and so there has to be some buy-in from the writer. I mean, Adura has been amazing in terms of just generally, but also just kind of throwing herself at it and, and being the willingness to recognise, you know, that whilst expensive shit was, uh, the, the play was a brilliant thing unto itself being able to kind of rip it up and start again and, and kind of freeing herself of, of everything that she had invested in expensive shit that's a really hard thing for you know I think adapting your own work is a really challenging thing to do and I, I don't think a lot of people can do it I think you know um, I've had experience before of novelists trying to adapt um, their work for screenwriting and I think it's just that it can be very hard thing when you've invested so much of your time and your effort into into one story and then you're starting to kind of transfer it to another medium whereas Adura just was able to see it as a distinct thing and uh, was very agile and able to kind of respond to the needs of the story um, very kind of intuitively um, but yeah we go through a process where we work quite a lot internally and then with, then we share it with the funders um, and then we have either, usually it's um, the notes are, um, we have a conversation and then, they'll maybe, then we'll maybe ask them to follow up with, with written notes because sometimes a conversation can be quite hard to, you know, when a doer then goes back to um, address the notes in, in the draft, it, it, to be able to have specific kind of points written down is really helpful, I think, um, because there's something quite kind of organic, which is useful in, in the conversation, but um, it can be quite hard to revisit that if you don't have something text based to, to review. Yeah. And it also allows you to reflect. Yeah. Um, so there'll be a moment between the conversation and when you get the notes written and, um, and, and you will have done some thinking, even though you're not consciously aware of it so it's it's part of a process i think an ongoing process so i find that really useful but i think it's important to say that i it wasn't easy like the shift from theater to film wasn't like a walk in the park like there were definitely tears involved where i was like oh my god i don't know what i don't know what i'm doing and i feel lost because the parameters i normally use for storytelling are so different um 
So uh, it's important to say that it wasn't a walk in the park, but the thing I've learned is that you just keep coming back to it and you stick to it. And even in those moments where you're like, there's nothing here, you know, you stop, you go away, do something else, you come back to it. So there were definitely, it's definitely been a baptism of kind of trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, but now I look back, it all seems worth it. But there were definitely moments in there where I was like, no, no, no. I can't write for film. Do you remember Rosie? <laughs> no, yeah, I, I picked the phone and was like, I can't do it. Um, literally. Because um, I was so, I don't know why, it, it really made me very emotional sometimes when I, when I felt like I wasn't getting it right and there was a right way to do it and I couldn't find that right way. Mm. And now in hindsight, I look back and go, the best way to tell the story is is your way of telling the story and allowing the story to land for whoever's reading it, if you, may, if you know what I mean. It's not about there's a right way and a wrong way. And I think I, 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 I thought that at the beginning, I thought that there was one way to do it and it was right. Mm. Um, and actually, no, there isn't. Most important thing is, 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 is that voice that's uniquely yours, finding a way out in your story. That's it. Um, and, and execs are there to help you navigate whether that story is coming across that you want to tell is coming across or not. So there, it feels to me like the execs that have worked, especially Paul Welsh, sort of honed in on what sort of stories I like to tell and what I was sort of interested in. And then his notes very much became about drilling into that more and more and more. But he needed to invest in me as well, invest in in my, in my voice, if you like, for that to work. Mm. I think because I think sometimes new writers underestimate how difficult the development process can be and how long it can be as well. And I suppose with theatre, it's always your the thing you're making. You can always change it as you go along, and you can respond to the audience and change feedback. In film, it feels like there's one chance you have the shoot date, and there's a lot of pressure in that development process to get something on the page that everyone. It can see the same vision, and that is a hard thing to do. Um, yeah. So, I mean, um, can you talk maybe then about how you've taken your learnings from writing the short film and into writing your feature film? Because uh, that really felt like a luxury to have all that big page count. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nope. Uh <laughs> Uh, luxury. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> more to do. I really loved writing the short. I really am like, you know, 15 pages is a beautiful thing. Mm. 90 pages is a whole other uh, uh, sort of endeavour. Um, the two were happening in tandem. So it's difficult to know that one led to the other in a way. And there's such different stories that I there's a tightness to the short film that I don't have to have in, in the feature, in the writing of the feature, but not just because it's a feature, but because of the story I'm telling. It's, it's an intimate um, relationship between a mother and a daughter. So there's time for us to get into it and character is just as important, if not more important as plot. Um, so I can't really, the one thing I, I suppose I took into the writing the features that I knew it would take a long time. I knew that there was a process of feedback and reflection and then writing again that, um, that I needed to go on. And I also lost my way in writing the feature. Like I did a first draft and then I did a first draft revision that just, you know, and I lost my way a little bit because I was like, oh no, story, story, story is the thing when actually in reality, what I wanted to get was the quality of the relationship between these two people, as well as the story. Um, so it's been it's been a real journey, hasn't it, Rosie? Yeah, yeah, we're also in a bit of a kind of pressure cooker with because we went through and it was brilliant. I features, mm -hmm. but there was definitely a frame that we were, um, you know, in terms of the drafts that we were delivering within, which isn't you know, obviously you know. The timeline is really important, but sometimes, especially with a first time writer, you you know, it, it can take longer, right? And so I think that when we got to the end of my features and it was first draft revisions, oh, it was up to second draft revisions. Yeah, it was. 
And it wasn't really though, like where we were in terms of the process, we were still at first draft revisions, really. We were a draft behind, but because that was, you know, the steps that we were going through within that programme, um, that's what it was called. But I think, you know, so we finished Eye Features um, uh, 2019. When did we finish Eye Features? Yeah. And it's been like a year since then. And so it's gone through, I think, well, it's been more than a year since then. And it's gone through so much more. Uh, it's had such a bigger journey, I think, post Eye Features than it did because it was, you know, it was a brilliant initiative and it's, it, it was great to have that kind of profile and it's definitely helped in terms of keeping momentum and getting to us the point now that we're financing the film to shoot in the spring. But um, at the same time, it, 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 you know, to navigate that and all the opportunities of that whilst trying to focus, as Dura says, on the core of the story and the characters and, and trying to keep that front and center was quite a challenge with everything else kind of, you know, um, going on in tandem, as well as in the short. I mean, basically we just like chucked it all in the door at once and said, here we go, let's just do this. And, and so of course it was a roller coaster at times, but I think, you know, we've come through the other side of it now and, and it's, you know, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, I think that it's what we said before as well about how you take note and whose notes to take. And um, I think I definitely used to take notes on the nose and think that I need to just do what the note says when actually all the note is telling you is that something doesn't work. Doesn't, you know, the note shouldn't tell you what to do. They should, they should give you room to go off and find how to solve it for yourself. And I think with eye features, there were a lot of execs over it. And I, I often felt like I was getting different steers from different people. And because I wasn't absolutely confident in my capabilities, I definitely went down rabbit holes that had nothing to do with my, what well, the story I wanted to tell. I'll just be really honest. It's like, yeah, you know, I was like, oh, you must be right because you've been doing this for ages, but actually I'm the, it's my story and it's my idea. So I hold on to that. And I say that you and I understand that your notes are helping me see the places that certain things aren't working, but they're not actually necessarily there shouldn't be steers in what I should do and what should happen in the story. Exactly. It can't be too prescriptive, can it? I mean, it, like when you get to, you know, your financing draft, then you can have almost like fine cut, you know, quite precise notes at that point, I think. But before that, there's, I think it's about asking as a producer who like focuses a lot on story development. I think it, it's always about asking the questions really mm -hmm. more as, because you don't have the answers, it's a Dura that has the answers, but we're kind of, I know what she wants, you know, because we've been working closely for a number of years, I have a, like a, a real understanding of what we want to achieve and what she wants to achieve and I'm supporting her to get there. And um, it's asking the questions of, of why things aren't working and helping her kind of, you know, probe it. But ultimately it's a Dura that's coming up with the answers. And I feel, you know, uh -huh. prescriptive notes aren't aren't really helpful to process especially too early on when when you're finding your voice as a writer but also when you're finding um the story as well mm. so um oh god my mind went i had a question lined up and then i'm just like it's gone it's gone <laughs> um but, but oh, i know it's come back um so the I'm curious to know, did, was it just the two of you in the development process for Girl and for um, Expansive Shit, or you had a script editor as well? Within our team, there was quite a lot of us. So, right. um, with, so there's, a, there's Kira and myself, yeah. um, and, and Kira is across the development process as well. Um, but we kind of, you know, I, we kind of take it in turns, especially we both had maternity leave and stuff as well, mm. so it's all a bit. <laughs> Um, and then we also had a uh, junior producer, Leah, who was across um, the development of uh, expensive shit, um, as well as in this, so in SFTN, there was the execs of SFTN, and then there was also Write for Film, a script editor that we worked with, who ended up being the same script editor that we worked with on Eye Features. So, uh, and there was a different director attached for a while with Girl, um, who gave notes as well. Um, so yeah, there was 
Yeah. We wouldn't do it that classics, way again. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but, you know. Uh, I think I, there's a process you go to of trusting each other as well. Like, obviously, I, I, you know, I don't want to put words in Rosie's mouth, but coming from theatre, never having written for film, um, never having written for film, there's a process that needs to happen where we all have faith that it's possible that the writer can make the transition from theatre to film. And that can be sticky sometimes because it's not a smooth, it's not necessarily a smooth journey. Um, I might be rambling now, but I, th I guess what I'm saying is part of that process was all of us trusting each other that the material was going to get to the point that we needed it to get to and we so, and we so wanted it to. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's something that isn't talked about enough. You have to trust your producers and, and they have to trust you. And that doesn't necessarily happen overnight. That's like a process. Mm -hmm. Like anything, you know, it's, that's, you know, we've been working together for four years. So it's, it's, it takes to, to start in a, quite a kind of raw place as a writer does. And um, you build a relationship whilst you're building the story in tandem. So it can take a while to get to that point, you know? Yeah. So can we talk about sort of, so you've developed the script, you've got the script, um, you have to shoot it and then you have the finished film. So was there something first on set that maybe wasn't in the script that came about, you know, during the production phase? Or was there anything you had to lose from the script and compromise on? Um, and then maybe we can talk about the audience side of it and the completed film. So let you speak. <laughs> so um, I guess people that are listening are sort of writer directors, right? Um, yeah, I think a mix. So um, this amazing thing happens where you've been writing for ages and you've got, you're so, you know, you think you're the writer director, but really you've got the writer's head on as you're going through the process. And then mm -hmm. you get on the shoot and you've got live bodies and performers in front of you and you've got your monitor and, and you've got to switch your head a little bit from what you imagined it was going to be to what you've got in front of you. And often that's a really beautiful thing because actors, your DOP, everybody will elevate your story and you're, you know, you're along for the ride. But also there can be a part of you that's like, yeah, but this is not how I imagined it. And, and, mm -hmm. and letting go of that is an interesting thing. Um, so, for example... A very small thing is Tolu's nails. In my head, Rosie doesn't know this, but in my head, she never had fake nails. Like, I, I don't know, I just always thought there was a purity to her, so her nails were always gonna be just her nails. And then in talking to... Um, um, Cat Morgan. Yeah, Cat Morgan. She was like, why doesn't she... She would absolutely do her nails. They would be bling nails. And I was like, what? And because in my head, it just felt like that's not the character I've been writing for two years. She doesn't have bling nails. And then just that little detail made me realize, of course, she would have bling nails because she's absolutely aiming to be like the women who come into the toilets, all dolled up, mm -hmm. clubbing for the night. It's just an extra detail that just gives this thing. So things that you you didn't think of as you, with your writer head suddenly become elevated in the collaboration of like, the shoot and, and prep for the shoot. Things like that were really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then for me, the most significant change, and that's, and I think this is probably one of the things I love most now about the process after shooting was the editing phase and realizing that you just don't need, it's okay to write it and write too much. Um, but it was beautiful in the editing process to go, nope, not needed, nope, not needed, nope, not needed, and to just hone in on, on the essential beats of the story and how then it just became, oh, it just became much more alive for me and much more kind of, um, it, it felt more thrilling as mm -hmm. a result of that editing process than it had ever been on the page. I mm -hmm. felt myself being, being taken through a night in a way that didn't quite happen on, 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 on the page. So I really loved that process. Oops, yes. Yeah, it's a great example, then I also love it. Um, it's, and similarly, is there anything since the film's been showing at film festivals, the audiences and seeing it on screen yourself, you've um, 
maybe maybe not for you but um for audiences is there something they picked up on that you never would have thought they would have picked up on about the story in its in its script form or something that's come out much stronger in, in the visual sense I can't think of that. No, I can't. Im I haven't really spoken to lots of people about what they. Have I mean, that's the challenge. It's still in the. And yeah, we're in twenty twenty. We're in COVID yes. time, so. Yeah, but um, but I certainly feel like, from my point of view, the things that I would want to take into the feature that I've learned from the short that I didn't know about before the short because I was new to filmmaking. I felt because of my theatre background, I felt comfortable with the act with actor and performance. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was more ignorant about the technical aspects of filmmaking. So I think there was, there was for me, watching the short now, there's a kind of visual bravery that it doesn't have. Um, it feels quite realist, quite conventional in the way it's, it, it, it's shot. Um, and that's fine. But I think going forward, the visual storytelling has to be as distinctive as the plot story or the character story, you know? It's like another layer and, and there's like room to, um, there's room to be brave with that. And I know that now, and, and I didn't know that as much before. And I'm excited by that um, in a way that before I was just a bit, oh, I don't know enough about that. I haven't been to film school. I, I you know, I don't, I don't know lenses and angles and all that kind of stuff, but I knew story and that, that is good. And that is a really important element. But um, somebody said to me recently that these days when you make films, your visual language has to be as distinctive as the story. That's what film is demanding now. And that's mm. really exciting to me. Well, I think you nailed it with the look of um, expensive shit. Like it's not easy to, it's quite a challenge to shoot in a club and make it feel like it is you know, a club and there's people in there and music and lights and you've got all that in there. So good. It's good to hear. Thank you. Um so I'm gonna go to I've, I've sort of reneged on my promise a bit and gone in a bit late for the questions, but please keep typing them in. Um so we've got one from Esther saying, um, I know you said you had a few trainees on the production. Any advice for new graduates or young people trying to forge a career in production in 2020? What's the best way to make yourself stand out with the job market so flooded at the moment? That's for you, Rosie, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's, as a producer, it's really important um, for me to always think about the next, you know, who's coming through and to support people coming through as well, because it is, particularly now, um, can be a challenging industry to, to navigate and get into. So um, I think if you're a graduate, you're you're probably in a good place because there's already, um, you know, as a starting point, there should be networks around the university um, and they can, should be able to support you with that transition. There's also uh, a number of um, like screen skills and training schemes. So as part, you know, for publicly funded film, there is a requirement um, to bring in uh, a number of trainees uh, so there's initiatives, I think, um, that you can sign up for. Uh, and also obviously like the short film program that um, Short Circuit are running, you know, there'll be crew uh, needed for that. And, and often there's training kind of roles within, within those two. So I think it'd be, it's worthwhile kind of connecting in with um, Short Circuit, with also with um, Creative Scotland, BBC, uh, screen skills, any of these kind of organisations, they should, there should be opportunities through that as well as individual filmmakers, you know, uh, production managers are, are a good way, film buying is a, is a good resource. Thanks Rosie. Um, question from Linda. Uh, Adura, I was wondering if you found the two-way mirror before shooting and it inspired you or did you try to find one after writing the script? Uh, that the, the set was built for the film, so that, that's a set that the film is set in. And, um, and the two-way mirror was in the play, so uh, and it was based on um, a, 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 a true story or a real location. So I suppose the two-way mirror always inspired an aspect of the story and definitely inspired us moving into the film because it was one of the most visual aspects of the play. Um, so it needed to feel in 
like a location that was central to the film, those two spaces. Does that answer your question? Does that answer the question? I think, I think so. Um, so Sophia says, uh, Adura, was it hard directing? What challenges did you face when coming on the helm? Was it hard directing? It was a baptism of fire, literally. <laughs> I mean, it was an adrenaline rush. It was amazing. It was a five day shoot. It was wild. It was like, it was just like a roller coaster ride. Um, and, but I had a great team around me, but there definitely was a moment in the shoot where I was like, oh my God, what are we doing? We had just filmed the actor playing the assault essentially. And I, I'm really surprising to me. I just kind of, I, I got a bit emotional. I don't know if, doesn't seem like it should be a surprise but I really had to question myself like when you see it real in, and played out in front of you it made it just realer from this thing that I'd been writing for like so many years and I remember taking Rosie aside and going why are we putting this out in the world there's enough of it in the world anyway why are we doing this why are we putting another woman's broken body on screen you know and um and we had a chat about that about um about why we're doing it and what we're trying to say and what the film is trying to say. Um, but so in your question, yeah, it was hard, but it was thrilling as well. It was absolutely thrilling. And I loved every moment of it, even those moments that were really tough. Thanks, Adora. Um, so Shirley asked, oh, sorry. Sorry, Rosie. Did you say? Did you say something, Rosie? Or was no, that... did I? No, I don't Sorry, think so. I am <laughs> hallucinating, clearly. <laughs> um, so we've got a question from Shirley. Um, if you shot expensive shit again, how would it look different in terms of what you said earlier about visual language and style? Okay, so I, I think that that two-way mirror offered some possibilities for shots that we couldn't take um, because of the time we had just the thing about reflection and what you're seeing of yourself versus how people are seeing you. I think there was a lot of potential in that. I think there was also some potential in sort of zeroing in on kind of the parts of our bodies we're most interested in showing off and, um, and, and what, and also that we don't like to show off as women. I mean, it's just little things like that. And I feel like, there could have been more visual bravery around that. I, I keep seeing partial views a lot more than we've got in the film. And um, that, that has to do with what we want to see and what we, and what we pretend we don't see. Do you know what I mean? Sort of thing. Um, yeah, so things a bit like that. Uh, I think we could have been maybe tighter around Tolu and, and the dilemma that she was in. And that could have felt grittier almost and, and less maybe polished. Um, yeah, things like that. Um, so I've got a question, a two part question for each one of you here. Um, do you have any advice for writing treatments, both from a writer's perspective, Adura, with your treatment for expensive shit? Um, what main aspect did you want to communicate? And then Rosie, from a producer's perspective, what do you look for in a treatment? Rosie, do you want to go first on that? <laughs> uh, yeah, so if somebody's approaching us with a treatment, I suppose I am looking for, um, well, obviously something unique in its, its storytelling. So in terms of the character or the point of view or um, the setup, I would like to kind of, I would hope that there was the sense of the potential of, um, a story with catharsis, but with characters that are complex and um, have potential to change. Um, so these, and also what I, I'm more interested in stuff which I haven't seen before, of course, you know, um, from different perspectives, underrepresented perspectives. I think also the, the treatment is a tool it's not just um, an opportunity to kind of pitch your work to people, but we'll work uh, on treatments for a really long time internally before we move to draft. I mean, most writers hate that process, but we find it can be really helpful, you know, to, to really hone in on the story and the characters in a shorter document, like a treatment, 
before we move to draft because once you're in draft there's all other things that you're having to address but yeah so the treatment has kind of a dual purpose from our perspective and rose is right i hate treatment <laughs> uh, but uh, essentially they are absolutely essential to essentially they're absolutely essential to write in your first draft um because they're a blueprint you know and um of course things can change and you can go in different directions but if you get it right in a treatment you get the arc of the characters and the arc of the story it makes it easier to write this, your first draft so it is definitely something that i'm glad is around even though it's hard to do um and it was hard for me to do but yeah i think it's just really really necessary and the best advice i got for that first moment of writing your treatment was pretend that you're talking you're telling somebody the story in a pub or just what would you say what's important to you what, what would you highlight what bits of the story absolutely have to be gotten across mm -hmm. and and that was just a really good way of a first draft as opposed to thinking oh there's a really there's a right way to do this and i I'm, and i can't get it just get it out like you're just chatting to a friend about it as a, as, a, as a first go and then it becomes about tweaking it around tone and style but that that felt to me like it came from it came after being sure what the arc of my story is but it still changed a lot once i got to first draft but it, it felt like solid scaffolding going into the first draft which is good mm -hmm. No, that's really great advice, especially for people out there that are writing their first features applications to apply to us because we ask for that sort of story outline and um, yeah, like you're telling somebody in a pub what your story is. That's what we want to see. Um, so I'll try and answer all the questions that are here if, if that's okay with you both, just to, we've got a couple more. Um, so Adura, how did you manage the pacing and adapting to a short film? Did this happen mostly in the edit? Would you, what, what do you think that, what do you mean by pacing? I don't know what pacing, like... I suppose the pacing pace of the film. Yeah, the pace of the film, the story, um, and how quickly it moves, I suppose. Yeah, um, I think that was partly already in the script, but it definitely revved up in the editing process, and it was what I was talking about before, that suddenly when you have the visuals, you're like, oh, I don't need three beats. It all says it in one. And you, you get rid of it, what you don't need. So it definitely became much tighter. I loved the edit, editing process for that. I think when I was writing for theatre, I always wanted to write like that. And I was always pushed towards, no, we need more. We need more backstory. We need to understand the characters. And my feeling was, in order to be slightly ahead of the audience, you, you, you can't really spoon feed them, you know? And we're all so versed now in film and TV that, Nobody has time to hang around, get in there. Except mm -hmm. if it's something that ex expansive in terms of character and by hanging around, we find out more about the characters. But generally, to be in front of the audience, you need to be quite brutal with those beats. Yeah. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Okay, right. Let's do a quick fire round. <laughs> um, so Rosie, one for you, maybe. How has your how has COVID um, affected your festival strategy and plans for the release of the film? Um, well, we haven't been able to screen in front of a live audience, right? And that there's something quite unique about sitting in a room with a couple hundred people mm -hmm. and feeling the energy and hearing how they respond to the film. It really kind of shifts your can shift your perspective on something which you know so well. Mm -hmm. um, so that and a kind of on a personal level and for Adura as a, as a new, you know, writer director for screen, there's something unique about that that I, you know, we've missed out on. Um, and then in terms of the the future life of the film, it's kind of been an unknown, you know, because as long as the pandemic goes on, every festival announces um, how they're going to manage, you know, and um, what kind of festival they're going to be able to offer. So there's been a kind of, I guess, an increase in this hybrid form of, of online and um, physical festivals where possible. So we've, I suppose, been more open to online um, screenings than we would have necessarily done, been before, because 
you know, recognizing that um, physical uh, screenings are going to be limited and reduced, and so therefore there's going to be less opportunity to to be selected for a festival that is um, operating in a kind of a third of what they would usually be programming. Mm -hmm. So we have taken opportunities to yeah to screen online in a way that usually you would hold back your online life of the film until um, maybe a year after you've had your festival life, right? Um, but it's definitely been much more in tandem. We've had to be quite kind of reactive to what um, and take opportunities as, they, as they've come, you know, rather than knowing because the landscape's been changing so much. Yeah, it's a shame that we can't sort of engage with you guys as an audience today because we do have a, a number of people here that have just watched the film. Um, so I'll, I'll ask one more question if that's okay. Um, Wilma says, thank you. It's been such a great session and very inspiring um, as creative mums with young kids. Um, what's your advice, Adura, for, get, for a brand new writer in getting their writing started? Um, I think it's a oh, brand new writer, getting your writing. Uh, I think schemes like Short Circuit are doing are really good. I think doing as many kind of workshops as you can is really useful. Um, try and stay away from there being a right and a wrong because there isn't, there's your voice and what you're trying to do is hone in on your voice and, and get that out in the best way possible and that's a process. But I think, um, yeah, it's been really useful to me having Rosie and Kira and having that support and for the moment where I felt like I couldn't, I didn't know what I was doing or I couldn't do it. So I think having people around you that you trust um, and that you can be supported by through what is a really difficult process sometimes is really useful. But also just have faith that you as a unique person with a story to tell, that you definitely do have a story to tell and it's worth telling. Um, I think sometimes we don't, we don't believe that about ourselves, but I think we should. Thank you. That's a very inspiring note to end on. Um, so thank you both so much for speaking to us and um, we look forward to seeing Girl um, and best of luck with it next thank spring. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody thank you for having us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to do a quick plug for our um, feedback survey, which Laura's posted in the chat. If you could take a couple of minutes to fill in, we'd really appreciate it. Um, and Adora's kind of mentioned the value of like schemes and training opportunities. So we have Convergence open now, um, please do apply. Um, we have the Short Film Club next week and we also have another screenwriting themed event, um, which we're announcing in January, uh, which has a new sort of peer to peer kind of format. It's quite interactive. It's gonna be led by writer director Catherine Lindstrom and she's gonna help you sort of shape your film idea. So it's an idea that you actually bring your um, idea to workshop through that session. Um, and take into a script form. Um, so look out for that in January, follow us on social media and subscribe to our newsletter to find out about it. So thanks again, both of you and have a lovely Christmas, everyone. Thank See you, you in 2021. Bye.